turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. And this, of course, is our, as you see in the bulletin, is our scripture background reading as we look at the Canons of Dort, fifth head of doctrine. We're looking at articles 9 through 11 this morning. And we'll be wrapping up our series of sermons on the perseverance of the saints this morning and also on the Canons of Dort. And so for our scripture background reading, we're looking at Romans 8, starting at verse 1 to verse 17, <clears throat> where Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's a verse every one of us should be familiar with and should be able to turn to any time we're going through distress and troubles in our lives, when we're conflicted about our sins and our sinfulness we're not familiar with this verse, uh, we're, we're missing out in quite a bit. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we also may be glorified together. Our song of preparation is number 386, How Vast the Benefits Divine Which We in Christ Possess. And, and take a special note of stanza 3, Safe in the arms of sovereign love we ever shall remain. Um, let's rise to sing the three stanzas of number 386.
also invite you to turn with me to page 110 and 111 in the back of the Blue Psalter hymnal <coughs> as we look this, after this uh, morning at the Articles 9 to 11 of the Canons of Dort, Chapter 5, Fifth Half Doctrine and the Perseverance of the Saints. <coughs> Page 110 and 111. <coughs> here we find a summary of what we believe the Bible teaches concerning our preservation unto salvation. Article 9, of this preservation of the elect to salvation and of their perseverance in the faith, true believers themselves may and do obtain assurance according to the measure of their faith, whereby they surely believe that they are and ever will continue true and living members of the church and that they have the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. Article 10, this assurance, however, is not produced by any peculiar revelation contrary to or independent of the Word of God, but springs from faith in God's promises, which He has most abundantly revealed in His Word for our comfort, from the testimony of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children and heirs of God, and lastly, from a serious and holy desire to preserve a good conscience and to perform good works. And if the elect of God were deprived of this solid comfort, that they shall finally obtain the victory, and of this infallible pledge of eternal glory, they would be, of all men, the most miserable. Article 11, the scripture moreover testifies that believers in this life have to struggle with various carnal doubts, and that under grievous temptations they do not always feel this full assurance of faith and certainty of persevering. But God, who is the Father of all consolation, does not suffer them to be tempted above that they are able, but will, with the temptation, make also the way of escape, that they may be able to endure it. And by the Holy Spirit again inspires them with the comfortable assurance of persevering. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this past week, of course, the biggest news story was the cancellation of the meeting between U.S. President Donald Trump and Chairman of North Korea Kim Jong-un. And now it's back on again, according to the news last night. But I don't think anybody who heard of this were overly surprised, knowing the history and the characters of these two individuals. But it did leave the world, didn't it, with a, a certain sense of uncertainty, as to what North Korea is up to. The question still remains kind of hanging in the air because they've always been kind of secretive about their actions. Are they continuing to build nuclear weapons? What kinds of plans do they have for the future and for the world? Can they be trusted? How, how safe are we really? And this is just one example of the uncertainty of this world. It was just a week ago that the alarms were raising in uh, British Columbia as the waters continued to rise and they were expecting much more flooding and much more devastation to happen and more damage to be done. And yet we hear now in just a matter of a few days of the water receding. With warmer months have come forest fires. In the meantime, to much to everyone's surprise, parts of Nova Scotia and PEI received 35 centimeters of snow this past week. And so life in this world can be so unpredictable and so uncertain. Even in our daily lives, we never quite have the complete assurance that things will remain as they are. Our brother Gerben's stroke this past Wednesday is again evidence of that, of the uncertainty of life that we never know what's around the corner, what's around the next turn. A stillborn baby is a reminder again to us of the uncertainty of this life. The farmers of our congregation have seeded their fields, but God alone knows how things are going to go this summer, if there's going to be enough moisture for those crops to grow well, if hail is going to come and wipe out entire fields once again, what the weather will be like come harvest time, what the price of grain will be once we start selling our, our, our produce. Will it be a year of profit or will it be a year of tremendous loss? Only God knows. We're not absolutely sure and we can't be sure in this life. In our daily lives there is uncertainty about our jobs, our, our vocation, our children, our schools, our relationships, our health, our safety, 
There's so much of which we can be unsure in this life. But congregation, as we look at the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints this morning, once again, we are reminded that there is one thing in this life of which we can be absolutely sure, even if it may not feel like it at times, and that is the security of our salvation. True believers, we confess, may be assured that God will continually bless us with His gracious work through His Holy Spirit to preserve us to the end, that we will finish the race, that we will keep the faith, that we will receive that crown of righteousness that God has won for us in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, as we look at Articles 9 to 11 of the fifth head of doctrine of the Canons of Dort, we want to summarize what we learn here with this theme, we believers confess our assurance of God's preservation. We believers confess our assurance of God's preservation. We'll see in the first place the, re the reality of this assurance. In the second place, the reason for this assurance. In the third place, the reliability of this assurance. But as we believers confess our assurance of God's preservation, we see in the first place the reality of this assurance. We're saying that we can be sure. This is something that is real, something we can know. That God's love will continue toward us. That we, we can be sure it is a reality for us that we are citizens of the kingdom on the way to God's kingdom. We can know for sure that we will indeed take final possession of all of God's gracious promises. We're saying that we can know that the Lord will preserve us to the end until the day when He Himself will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. That's a reality for us as believers. Article 9 reminds us that believers may and do obtain assurance. Now, boys and girls, before we go one step further, let's pause and ask this question. What's a believer? They say here, believers can and do obtain assurance. What's a believer then? Well, over the time that I've been a pastor and even a Christian, I've heard the definition for that stretched as thin as spaghetti. And so we have to understand, really, and we have to come back to understand what is a believer, really. A believer is not a good person, a person who tries their best and st strives to do nice things. A believer is not merely someone who has some kind of church affiliation or has some church in their background. A believer, here it is, a believer is one who truly and sincerely trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. Okay? A believer is a person who truly and sincerely trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so if you're talking to someone, they say, I'm a Christian, you talk to them about Jesus. And if they have nothing to say about Jesus, they have nothing to add to the conversation, leaves the question hanging in the air, is this person a true believer? Believing has to do with Jesus. Our faith, our joy, our hope centers upon Jesus. Everything for the Christian is Jesus. Every answer to the question, as the boys and girls know in catechism, is Jesus. And a believer is one who, possessing the Holy Spirit of Christ, confesses that Jesus is not only my Savior, He not only died for me on the cross, but He is my Lord, He is my Master, I follow Him. And so, it's not just a matter of church membership, or church attendance even, it's about being converted, that is, your heart is changed, it is being convicted that the only God is the God of the Bible. Only He alone is God, the triune God, and the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ. That's what being a believer is. Okay, having defined that, such believers then, we confess, may and do obtain assurance. We may possess the knowledge that we are and ever will continue true members of the church and that we have forgiveness of sins and life eternal. Now, some people hear that and they say, well, that's kind of proud to say. That's pride talking. We shouldn't talk like that. We shouldn't boast that we have eternal life, that I know I am forgiven, that I know that if I die, I will go straight to heaven. I had a, a man chastise me one time um, because he uh, had me sat, sitting at his kitchen table. And I remember because his face looked angry and he was, there was much finger wagging and he looked to lean over the kitchen table and he said, if I die, don't you ever say that we know that he's in heaven. You know, because some people were raised in a background that says, uh, you know, that's prideful. 
We don't know. Nobody knows. We shouldn't boast about our salvation. And I remember looking back at him after I got over my initial nervousness and I said, well, do you believe in Jesus as your Savior? Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? He said, yes. I said, okay, well, your wife is going to have to sue me because I will say it at your funeral. Um, but that's how strong people are on these things. Um, they think it's pride talking. But it's not pride. It's reality. It's the truth. It's the Bible. It's, we talk this way because the Bible commands us to talk that way. Paul believed that. And so would we go so far as to say, well, Paul was very uh, full of himself and prideful? In 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, he says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Would we say that's Paul being boastful and full of himself? Would we say Job was full of himself when he said in Job 19, verses 25 and following, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Is that boasting? Is that prideful? Was that sinful? Listen to the author of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 let us this is speaking to all of us as new testament believers let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful okay we possess that hope god is faithful let us hold on to it let us not doubt about uh, let us not doubt it um, again in romans 8 verse 1 we heard that what i said was the most wonderful verse um, we have to be familiar with this uh, Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You hear that language? No condemnation. There is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that the, uh, no guilty verdict will ever be passed again upon believers. What we have done, all the sins that we have done, and all the sins that we will do until the day of our death, will never be held against us. For the sake of His Son, Jesus Christ, God will never turn His anger upon us ever again as believers. Jesus said in John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. That's not boasting, that's following the words of Jesus. We have it if we believe. John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone ever snatch them out of my hand. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 is quoted in Article 10. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In the Old Testament, we hear God saying that he has us engraved in the palm of his hand. And so we can't be erased in any way or taken off. We are engraved. In Psalm 27, verse 5, David confesses, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret, pla in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. And so can we be confident that God will preserve us to the end? Absolutely, based on the Bible. And by the way, it's a good reminder that, you know, this doctrine of perseverance of the saints, sometimes we feel a little bit embarrassed about, or, uh, about these doctrines that we hold to in the Reformed churches. We have to understand that this is not something people made up, and this is not just Reformed doctrine. This is not something just Dutch or whatever, however you want to put it. What we read before us in the Canons of Dort and in our confessions are faithful summaries of what the Scriptures teach. The saints of times past under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they knew and they believed that their salvation was secure and they put pen to paper under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They knew and they believed that God would preserve them to the very end. That was their hope and confidence. And this is still the reality of every believer. Our confession reminds us that according to the measure of our faith, believers surely believe that we will and will ever continue as true and living members of God's church and that we have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And the authors of the canons, as we find again and again in our confessions, they show great uh, knowledge and experience of, of uh, human emotions and, and uh, the state of Christians and an understanding of the church and how the church is made, what the church is made up of. 
the authors of the canons are very careful to add into that confession according to the measure of their faith. And that's important because they understood that not every Christian in a congregation is in the same place spiritually. In a congregation like this, in every congregation, we have spiritual babies, as we would call them, who are just learning the basics. You can think of our children who we are now teaching and training about the Lord Jesus Christ and about what the Bible teaches. We have the young Christians who are wrestling as they hit the teenage years, as they hit the young adult years. They're wrestling with what they've been taught and they're measuring that against what the rest of the world teaches and their normal day-to-day -day experiences. And then in a congregation like this, you have more mature Christians who struggle, no doubt, but are more steadfast in their assurance. Well, according to the measure of their faith, Christians may indeed obtain assurance of their salvation. They may know in their heart of hearts that they belong body and soul in life and in death to their faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Some more than others, no doubt. But listen, this confidence grows as our faith grows. And so this is a word of encouragement to us to be as, uh, to use the word, words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3, 18, it's a word of encouragement to us to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is as we mature in faith that we are more and more convinced of the truth of our confession. And we are grounded in the knowledge that we have that is, we are in possession of the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. That this is not something we look forward to. Maybe it will be ours someday. It's something we aspire to. I hope I have it. If you are a believer, the reality of your life is that you are in possession of salvation now. And therefore, God will preserve you to the very end. We may know this now. But how do we know that? As, God's, as we, God's people, confess God's gracious assurance of our preservation unto salvation, we see in the second place the reason or the basis of this assurance. In other words, upon what does our assurance that God will preserve us to the end rest? What, does that, what do we rest that on? Article 10 reminds us that this assurance is not produced by any peculiar revelation contrary to or independent of the Word of God. Now, peculiar is used in, in an older sense here and simply means individual or private or special. The point of the canons here is that the assurance that we are children of God and that we will persevere to the end is not a result of, say, a communication that God has made to us directly to each of us individually, a private or special um, revelation that he's given to us uh, directly. It's, it's not that. Like, you know, in the Old Testament, you hear about people getting dreams and visions, uh, things like that, um, some kind of a special moving. That's not how God convinces us that we are his and he will preserve us to the end. Now, we ask, well, why is that important to bring up? Because throughout its history, the church has had to engage the heresy of what is called mysticism. And mysticism teaches, and is still around very much today, not only in New Age churches, but even in some Christian churches, but mysticism teaches that we either don't need the Bible, we don't need the law of God, um, or these aren't enough, because we are led now by the Spirit directly. And so God speaks to me directly by the Spirit. And so you hear it today, if you've been following my exchange in the Panoka News with that uh, pastor from uh, the United Church, you hear it when people say, apart from the Bible, uh, that the Spirit is leading them. So mysticism is very much alive with us today. And it's a dangerous path to follow because it then leaves faith and life up to the individual. And, and instead of obeying the objective truth of God, which is the Holy Scriptures, the Christian life then becomes subjective, which is based on what I feel or what I think God is speaking to me. It's a very dangerous path to go down. In contrast to these peculiar or individual or special revelations to individuals, Article 10, in fact, lists three means or ways by which we receive the assurance of God's preservation. 
three means by which we may receive the assurance of God's preservation. The first thing that we rest upon is faith in God's promises. You say, what promises? Well, think, for instance, of perhaps the most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, think along with me, for he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is the great and grand promise, the gospel of the Bible. Or well, think of Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, where we're told that nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ. Or again, the words of Jesus when he said of us his sheep, no one can snatch us away from my hand. And so in his word, and we could read from Genesis to Revelation and hear promise after promise of, the, of, of, promise of uh, God's faithfulness and love, but in his word, it's not an arguable point, God does promise to preserve us. And God does not break his promises. He never has. And you see, it's, it, he can't. It's not even his nature. One of the... Um, the older kids, teenagers um, in the catechism class, church education classes, they learn about the attributes of God, especially when we study the Belgian Confession, Article 1. And we learn about an attribute of God which is called immutable. An immutable simply means unchanging. God does not change. One of the characteristics or one of the attributes of God is that He does not change. He cannot change. It's not in His nature to change. And so, so what does that mean for us? When God establishes a covenant of grace with us, and when He confirms that covenant of grace by the shed blood of His own Son, He's not going to change His mind. He's not going to take back that promise. When He has begun a good work in us, He will finish what He starts. He will hold on to us. Already in the Old Testament, it was confessed. In Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 24, through the Lord's mercies, and these are the Old Testament saints confessing this, by the way. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. And so the first thing that we may rest upon as we seek assurance that God will preserve us is, in, is, uh, in, is faith in God's promises. A second way we can be assured of our perseverance is from what the canons call the testimony of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children, that we are heirs of God. And that's almost a straight quote from the passage we read in Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. Listen to it again. Paul writes, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. The Bible tells us here that we are adopted. We, we have received the spirit of adoption, that we have become the children of God of God. You know, I'll be honest with you, every time I hear that word adopted or adoption, it makes me cringe a little bit. It's just kind of a leftover from my childhood. I grew up with uh, an older brother and sister who liked to torture me tremendously. And one of the things that they did was when I was around five or six, to the best of my recollection, they told me that I was adopted. They said that uh, mom and dad found me somewhere. I was lost. I was an orphan. And so they took me in and they adopted me. And I grew up uh, well, for many years. I thinking that I really didn't belong to this family. It wasn't true, of course, but that's how <clears throat> siblings like to torture their other siblings. I remember the feeling that would come over me when they would say these things. I would feel like an outsider, like I really didn't belong in this family. But, you know, I thought about that a little bit this week as I'm, as I'm working on this passage tonight. I thought, you know, that's really not a true meaning of the word adopted, um, especially biblically. That's not what adopted means. Adoption, when somebody is adopted, it means that they are now considered as belonging to that family. It means that they have all the rights and privileges as any biological child in that family. An ad adopted child isn't treated any different to your biological children. And now we're told that we have received the spirit of adoption. 
and that spirit changes our view of ourselves. When the Holy Spirit makes his home in our hearts, we begin to see ourselves no longer as outsiders, but as heirs of God's kingdom, as true children of God. With amazement, we begin to see that while before we were aliens and strangers to God's gracious love, now we belong to him. We can pray our Father who art in heaven. We begin to look to him in trust and dependence, believing that he is working all things together for our good. We take comfort in his tender, fatherly love. And all of this is the result of the Spirit's presence in us. And you know, sometimes if you find yourself asking this question, can I trust, can I really trust in God's preservation? Back it up a little bit and ask yourself these questions. Where do I turn when I'm in trouble? To whom do I turn when I'm in trouble? Do I, can I say with David, when I am afraid, I will trust in you? And who do you thank when things are going well in your life? And if your answer to those questions is the triune God, the God of the Bible, then it is because the spirit of adoption lives in our hearts, convincing us that we are his children. And so that's the second thing upon which we may rest as we consider whether we are, uh, will be preserved or not. A third way that we may be assured of God's preservation is from that serious and lasting desire to preserve a good conscience and to perform good works. Yes, Christians sin, sometimes terribly, but true Christians will always repent. There's a godly sorrow in our hearts when we sin, we have violated God's law, that we have trespassed against Him. Our consciences accuse us when we sin against God, when we sin against our neighbor. In the heat of the moment, and it, all, it happens to all of us, in the heat of the moment, we raise our voice or we say something insulting to somebody, but very quickly for the Christian, our consciences accuse us of sinning against God and against our neighbor. And we're quick to go to God and confess it and seek his help to avoid sinning in that way again. And you see, that's what separates the children of God from the children of the world. And that's another way in which we may know that we will persevere to the end because of that desire or that, uh, that conviction of our sinfulness and our, our um, desire to sin. Moreover, we also see in ourselves a desire to perform good works. And so that's another piece of evidence in our lives that we will persevere. We see a desire in us to, preserve, to perform good works. And again, we perform these good works not to gain our salvation or to keep ourselves in God's favor. We seek the good of others. We pray for those who are uh, facing challenges. We seek to do good works because the Spirit of God has made us good trees and enabled us to produce good fruit. Many of us prayed for our brother Gerben this past week. Many of us reached out to Yaakov and, and Elise. Why? Because the Spirit of God moves us to do good works and to feel compassion for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. People ask me from time to time, you know, what can we do for you and Doris? We know you guys have a hard life. We know that it's difficult. What can we do for you? Because Chris, that's what Christians do. That's what we do. We love each other. We care for each other. We reach out to each other. We seek the good of each other. And here's the, here's the bonus. By, that, by this means, we may know and we are assured that we are living members of Christ's church. And that God will bless us with faithfulness and perseverance so that we will finish the race and keep the faith to the very end. And listen to this. Um, from Article 10. And if the elect of God were deprived of this solid comfort that they shall finally obtain the victory, and of this infallible pledge of eternal glory, they would be of all men the most miserable. You know what that is saying? It's saying that if we did not have the assurance that God's promises, His Spirit's presence, and our desire to please God, if we did not have what those things give, we would be living out our lives without hope. We would be deprived of any comfort in this life. We would have no evidence that we are children of God and that He will preserve us to the end. And I don't know about you, but I can speak personally. If all I had to depend on 
for my salvation was how obedient I am to God every day, I would be the saddest, grumpiest, most depressing person that you have ever met. But thank God, it's not up to me, it's not up to you. He preserves us, and He will preserve us to the end, through every bump and every curve in the road. Which brings us to our third point. As we believers confess our assurance of God's preservation, we see in the third place the reliability of this assurance. Article 11 reminds us that even though we believers may not always be fully confident of our salvation, God will still preserve us. I just want to read Article 11 quickly with you again. The script, because it's such an important article, every Christian struggles with these things from time to time, uh, struggles of doubt and fear about their eternal destiny. The scripture, moreover, testifies that believers in this life have to struggle with various carnal doubts and that under grievous temptations, they do not always feel this full assurance of faith and certainty of persevering. But God, who is the Father of all consolation, does not suffer them to be tempted above that they are able, but will, with the temptation, make also the way of escape, that they may be able to endure it, and by the Holy Spirit again inspires them with the comfortable assurance of persevering. We're reminded here in this article of something that we have confessed before that all believers still retain and continue to suffer with what are called carnal doubts, sins of the flesh, doubts of the flesh. We're talking here about the struggles that we have because we are still in these fleshly bodies and the flesh is pr still prone to sin. The flesh is weak and it is inconsistent in our obedience to what God. And the thing is, as Christians, we see these weaknesses and these failings in ourselves. When we look at ourselves, what do we see? We see a lack of love for God and for neighbor. We see sometimes even how ungrateful we are towards God. We, sell, we see sometimes how unrepentant we are. And, and sometimes we wonder, even the seasoned Christian, we wonder if we are really children of God. And we think, how could a Christian sin like this? How could a sanctified person be tempted in this way? How could I indulge in such sins? You remember Asaph in the Old Testament in Psalm 73? He speaks of his foot slipping, of his envy of the proud. And he thinks that maybe he has cleansed his hand in vain. And so when we go through these things, remember, we're not alone. Every Christian struggles with these things for the rest of our lives. All Christians can relate to that. But here's our comfort. The Lord will never allow us to remain in doubt or to fall into sin to the point of losing our salvation. He will always provide, as we heard in 1 Corinthians 10, a way of escape. His hand will always remain upon us. His shepherd's crook will always remain above us. He will preserve us so that we will persevere to the end. And by His Spirit, He reminds us that we are and always will be His children and that He is our light and our salvation. And that's a wonderfully assuring thing. We can rely on God's faithfulness. Left to ourselves, we would very quickly lose interest in Christianity. We would become discouraged because we would think, what good am I? I'm not any good at this. We would be become impatient with ourselves and with others. We would be led astray by the attractions of this world, and they are great. The devil, who is very powerful, would make very short work of us. And so what a tremendous blessing and relief that the God of our salvation continues to the end to hold on to us, lest we perish on the way. And congregation, as we said, it could not be any other way because that is the very nature of God. He is ever faithful. He brings to completion what He begins. He will allow none of His elect to be snatched away or to wander away. He is the good shepherd who seeks and keeps His own in his care always. Now let's wrap this up. Let me ask you this, this morning. Look into your own heart and ask, what threatens my assurance in my salvation? What threatens my assurance? Maybe it's physical illness or the pain that I have to endure each and every day. Maybe it's some situation in my life. Is it, is maybe it's stress. Is, is stress sapping away your spiritual strength? Do you face enemies of a spiritual nature, temptations and sins that 
that you realize have the potential to destroy you? Doubt and fear that anchor you to despair? Are there times in our lives when our spiritual life is so dim that we wonder if it exists at all? Sometimes there are emotional struggles in our lives, things like depression and anxiety, feeling distant from God, and the guilt that then comes along with that. Our own sinful nature can pull us down again and again into discontent and discouragement and can cause us to question whether we are saved and whether we will be saved. Well, brothers and sisters, take heart. You're not alone in this. We're all in the same boat, but even better, we all have the same God who preserves us so that we persevere, who will never leave us nor forsake us. His hand will ever be upon us. He has purchased us with the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, and He will never let us go. To Him be all glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that our salvation is securely in your hands from beginning to end. From before the foundations of the world were laid, you chose us in Christ Jesus. You called us in your time. You justified us by his shed blood and broken body on the cross. You drew us to yourself by your Holy Spirit irresistibly. And you continue to preserve us so that we persevere. We pray that in all the trials and temptations and the struggles of our lives that we may find true light in your light, in your faithfulness, in your goodness, that you are our great shepherd who has not only laid down your life for the sheep, but who continues to lead and guide us, who will seek and save us so that we will never be lost as true believers. And we pray that for every member here, every uh, child, every young person, every middle-ager, every elderly person, that we may, that this congregation may be made up of true believers, those who confess the Lord Jesus Christ alone as their salvation and their Savior, and who walk behind him as their master and Lord and only King and Head. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In response, let's turn in our hymnals to number 419. Thus saith the mercy of the Lord. And let's rise to sing stanzas 1, 3, 4, and 5. Stanzas 1, 3, 4, and 5 of number 419. <laughs> 